happened was that in Europe, when I was resident, I consider this place like a temple, a temple of the Middle Year. They made the history of stapedotomy. We still use the coast piston Teflon. It's one of the most used piston for stapedotomy in the world. And they also made the history of uh, the reconstruction of the circular chain. This morning I arrived there, I see a lot of <laughs> new techniques, very precise techniques for reconstructing all the circular chain. Probably I am a very rough surgeon, too difficult for me, this kind of techniques. I, I, I read basic surgeon because also, probably because I also neurosurgeon, I essential, but I really was uh, impressed for the precision and about uh, the very precise de details in that you have occurred during your surgery. I work in, uh, in Siena, in uh, Siena University Hospital, and I'm very glad to work there because for the first time, also under the administrative point of view, we achieved the first uh, department, uh, the first uh, group uh, completely dedicated to the otology of the skull base surgery in one uh, public uh, institution, a public university. Because usually in Italy, the otology is a branch, uh, in the Europe, a branch of EMT. In Siena, otology is a completely separate department that has the same uh, administrative uh, power of the DNT department. So, as you know, cholesteatoma in children, we start with classification with congenital and acquired cholesteatoma. So, what I would like to give you during this lecture is just to refresh some basic uh, principle about cholesteatoma in children and at the end to be a little bit provocative uh, to stimulate uh, some active, uh, some burning dis discussion. Uh, what about, we start from the diagnosis because uh, we must clarify when the retraction POC has to be considered as cholesteatoma, when there is a marginal, when there is some keratin, and when there is some um, um, resorption on the bone annulus. These slides um, that consider the cholesteatoma wrong screen, the wrong place, as you can recognize this slide, is a courtesy of uh, Professor Jack Magnan. Uh, when I was uh, young, 25 years, 30 years ago, I had the chance to, to stay for a time, for some time with Mirko Tos. So for me, the classification cholesteatoma is still, the more practical classification is still the TOS classification. Atticholesteatoma, sinus atticholesteatoma, following the origin of cholesteatoma, etic, sinus, when the origin is in the sinus tympano, and tensile retraction cholesteatoma, when the, is arising from the parts tensor. So you see, atic cholesteatoma, sinus cholesteatoma, uh, tensor retraction cholesteatoma. Uh, there are many other classifications. I just would like to report the la one of the most recent, the Japan Otological Society, stage one, stage two, stage three. Uh, another part of classification according to extension of the epithelium to the following region, protympano, tympanic cavity, attic. Of course, I respect uh, this classification because it's the most complete classification in the world, but due to the fact, probably because I was born in countryside, a very simple man, and it's too difficult for me to follow and too difficult to me to keep in my mind, uh, even if uh, could be one of the most precise uh, when we want to report the complete results and uh, we can com compare different series of uh, patient operated. Uh, congenital cholesteatoma. The classic presentation of congenital cholesteatoma is like a cyst in the anterior superior mesotympanum attached to the anterior surface of the process of cochlariformis or tenson tympani tendot, but not the tympani membrane. Very often, 80% of congenital cholesteatoma uh, pre present themselves like a cyst in the anterior superior portion of the tympani membrane. Um, and you know that uh, the recidivism is, is considered 
significantly higher in children than, rather than in adults due to the probably immature station tube function, underdeveloped mastoidal cells, subsequent repeat, uh, otitis media, or oh, the um, mastoid is more traumatized for several reasons we consider cholesteatoma in children most dangerous and with either recurrence uh, respect than the cholesteatoma in the adults. The radiology, you know, you can distinguish, you can do the radiological diagnosis uh, instead of uh, the radiology itself when you see some mass that is um, with some resorption, some erosion in the bone, especially when the, you see the resorption of the attica spine, the resorption of the uh, corneum septum. But also, and this thank to the team of uh, Antwerp, that uh, we, today we can recognize very well the uh, cholesteatoma with the MRI, and this was in, very important to reduce uh, the second time, the second stage operation, and uh, to reduce uh, the operation in case of suspected recidivism of cholesteatoma. I don't want to lose your time with this uh, with, um, di radiological diagnosis because I know that there is Professor Thomas Sommers and uh, he will do something about it, do a lecture also probably in this topic uh, when we will speak about uh, the obliterative technique. And then it is a courtesy of Thomas Sommers in his honor that I report these slides. So you see cholesterol is very clear with the MRI is uh, hyperintensive in T1, hyperintensive in T2. We get some gadolinium enhancement on the margin, on the, around the matrix, because the matrix is active uh, part of the of cholesterol and uh, is important, the non epidiffusion technique that they developed uh, in, uh, in Belgium several years ago. Uh, but what I found in the literature as the real news is uh, this um, comparison with uh, the fusion technique in between CT and MRI that can provide us with a very precise, very detailed diagnosis uh, in case of recidivism or cholesterol. But we all go on, on surgery. Just a basic, basic principle of this surgery. We must provide our child with the dry safe and, if possible, also here in here. And uh, our surgical strategy depends on the origin cholesteatoma and the growth pattern and the station of the disease itself. And as you know, when we are dealing with uh, chronic otitis, in case of simple chronic otitis, we don't need to do a mastodectomy. We can discuss about uh, the need to do a mastodectomy in case of granulating otitis, but of course, in case of uh, cholesterol disease, uh, we must drill the bone, we must drill the bone, we must do a mastodectomy because we must, do, we must remove the cholesterol from his region, then we can do it uh, with uh, closed technique, open technique, uh, with uh, obliterative technique, uh, with any kind of technique. But um, the principle of uh, this technique, as you know, is a kind of wall up. The principle is uh, to dominate, to have a complete access to all tympanic recesses without removal with the maximal preservation the posterior bony wall. Why we want to preserve this posterior bony wall was uh, the border of our debate, our discussion for more than 30 years, because if, you because if you respect the posterior bony wall, of course, the healing, the post-operative healing is easier, is faster, and is safer. You know, in case of lateral epitympanic cholesteatoma, in case the cholesteatoma of cholesteatoma is interested only the lateral part of the major ossicles of the attica space, you can do transcanal approach, you can drill this bone, and you can reconstruct this, uh, this bone with cartilage or with some uh, autologous bone, like in this case. But when the cholesterol goes medial to the major ossicle, and you want to keep intact the posterior bony wall, you need the anterior 
uh, tympanotomy, you need the anterior articotomy, when the cholestatoma, like in this case, is medial to the ossicles, you need to do, if you want to preserve the posterior bony wall, you need to do the anterior tympanotomy. Anterior tympanotomy means to drill all the bone, all the chromatic root, in order to have a good access to the anterior space, space of the ethical recess, like in this case, this specimen. For the same reason, if you want to preserve the posterior bony wall in intercanal wall technique when the cholesteatoma goes inside the sinus tympani, of course, posterior tympanotomy is mandatory. So, you know the meaning of posterior tympanotomy, you know all the landmarks to do and proper appropriate posterior tympanotomy without uh, the angular facial nerve. So, if you want to keep intact the posterior bony wall, we must control all the superior posterior cells to forward the tympanotomy, anterior, lateral, and posterior tympanotomy. But when we are uh, talking about uh, open technique, then we go faster to the result to stimulate the discussion result in uh, cholesterol in children. Very often we start with the discharge here and we finish with the discharge here if you don't have care about uh, on uh, mm, very simple basic principles. Uh, I would like, I was impressed by this. Uh, uh, this scheme, this uh, drawing that I have seen in the very whole uh, uh, book of Hugo Fisch, uh, as you know, the basic principle is when you go, when you want to perform an open technique, please don't forget the self-cleaning of, of this here. Never leave some recess in the middle ear cavity and think about uh, an inverter truncate cone to improve the cell cleaning of the cavity. To achieve this uh, inverted truncate cone, first of all, you must skeletonize very well the facial nerve. You must uh, eliminate the facial nerve ridge. So this is for all of you that believe that uh, uh, an open technique is easier and is safer than an intercanal wall technique because uh, the facial is left away from uh, your drill is completely false. So if you want to do an appropriate open technique, you must remove all this bone and you must skeletonize the mastoid portion of the facial nerve, like in this case. All these uh, slides are a courtesy of uh, Professor Fish that and you can find in his book in 1994. But another well, if you want to reduce the rate of uh, discharge here after you uh, kind of wall down technique, you must uh, remove all the pneumatic cells. We start with sinodurangle, retrofacial cells, perilabyrinthal cells, supralabyrinthal, then sopratubal. You skeletonize the facial nerve, like in this case. And then at the end, uh, you can obliterate uh, with uh, muscle periostal flap or with bone darts on the whatever you want, but uh, I use only tissue, autologous <laughs> tissue of the patient of bony warts, bony darts, or uh, musculoperiosteal flap to obliterate this cavity and to reduce the recess. And then we do a very small meatoplasty. And uh, at the end, the results are that uh, the open technique, the obliterated open technique, uh, when uh, the follow-up seems to be the intercanal wall technique. But uh, what I would like to report in this uh, uh, presentation is a very old uh, study that we did uh, 25 years ago, together with Mirko Tos. I had uh, the chance to work with him at the beginning of the 19th, and we collect 114 children that uh, operated for otatic chronic, chronic otatic with cholesteatoma. The median age was nine years. The range was between three to 15 years. 
and the median follow-up was approximately six years, ranged from one to 16 years. Uh, 33 had an eticus, 45 sinus, and 36 tensa retraction cholesterol. In the total, 114 patients, 35, 31% were reoperated during the follow-up for different reasons, residual, recurrent cholesterol, reperforation, and so on. Uh, what was important is that we evaluate uh, this, um, this uh, recidivism, not only with the uh, standard test, but also with the capral mayer survival test. And with the capral mayer survival test uh, is the test that uh, is used um, especially in, uh, when we do some uh, study in after <coughs> oncologic uh, uh, surgery, but we use it, this capital may survival test because uh, it's uh, more precise, it's more reliable when we are dealing with the long-term follow-up. Uh, it can consider also the patient the loss at the follow-up. So it's a more severe st standard test. And when we evaluate all these patients uh, with the kaplan mayer survival test concerning the percentage of recidivism, we consider recidivism altogether recurrent and residual cholesterol. As you can see, we had a rather high percentage of residual and recurrent cholesterol during the follow-up. And especially these slides deserve some consideration. One, high rate of recidivism especially in case we articles cholesterol. The second, the first increase of recidivism was in between the first and the third year, but please look at that. We had a, an high percentage, high rates of recidivism in between the fifth and the seventh year. So it is very important because I will report later all the recent uh, uh, series so reporting the literature, uh, you will see that uh, no, in one series there is a, a follow up that more than six or seven years. So the detection time was uh, earlier for residual cholesterol and uh, for recurrent uh, between two and a half, three years. Like uh, uh, is showing this slide. But what about uh, the prognostic factor. What about the predictors of recurrence? Uh, extension of the cholesterol, one location or two or more locations, of course, was predictive for a recurrence. The intact resorbable circular chain, that is very important. Cholesterol operating in younger children was uh, more, uh, was more, uh, in children younger than 80 years uh, were more um, were associated with a more percentage of recidivism. Also, we, we ask all the children to try to do a Valsalva maneuver, positive Valsalva, negative Valsalva was other predictive factor, it, but not absolutely no significant factor in predictor of recurrence of cholesterol was uh, the dry or discharge in here. To finish, if we consider in the long follow-up, if we put together residual and recurrent cholesterol, in the long follow-up, if we evaluate with two different techniques, the recidivism of the cholesterol, one was uh, the standard incidence rate the second, the kaplan mayer uh, standard evaluation, we obtained a very high rate of recidivism, especially after the kaplan mayer survival test, uh, we evaluate, we calculate the possibility to have a recidivism in one out of three of these patients. I cannot forget when the, at the end of the 90s, uh, 15, 20 years ago, I presented this result in the Italian National ENT Congress, and uh, I had a lot of criticism for the audience. Some of them uh, told me that uh, I, 
I was too young, uh, you are not able to operate, do I recidivism uh, is not a surgery for you, why you are presenting these uh, very wrong results. But at the end, uh, I introduced uh, the real surgeon, the real surgeon of Miss Cotos, and the agents stopped to ask me other questions. Uh, the problem is uh, this study was done more than 20 years ago. In 20 years, uh, we had a lot of news in our field, the endoscopy, the laser, the navigation system, facial nerve monitoring, and also we had uh, the revolution of cochlear implant, of mid prosthesis. So now we can say, so old can hear. We, we can provide with the hearing everybody, but on the other hand, even if we had so uh, many technological development and we opened the era of the implants, the middle ear prosthesia, the cochlear implants, on the other hand, we didn't have any effective changement in these results concerning children cholestatoma. Why? Because I collect all the literature from 1998 to this year at least the most significant literature. As you can see, all this um, paper report on children's cholesterol report data evaluate uh, with uh, standard incident test, not evaluated with uh, a couple of mayor. And you see, all in, in this group, a group of patients in Italy, they evaluate this patient with a median follow-up of six, seven years, but the recidivism kind of was very high. So all the literature can confirm that in 25 years, if we change completely the history mm -hmm. of the children deafness, thanks to talk to the cochlear implant program, we didn't change significantly 1%, we didn't improve 1% of our results concerning children cholesteatoma, concerning the recidivism of children cholesteatoma. So just uh, to, I would like to citate the, mm -hmm. the real news that uh, I really was impressed by the results in the recurrence rate after the obliterative technique reported by Professor Sommers and officers from Antwerp. And I'm really looking forward to attend the, his presentation of tomorrow. But to tell the truth, I would like to stimulate uh, also a little bit of discussion. I was a little bit provocative. I presented a paper published 20 years ago, and then 20 years we didn't achieve any significant improvement in this kind of subject. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope uh, I will have to keep you away after, after lunch because it's not the right time to listen to some kind of lecture. Thank you very much, Marco. Uh, any questions in the audience? We have a little bit of time for questions. Go ahead to So, a simple question. In your classification of attic and uh, then you said the tense uh, sinus, is, is there any other name for it, sinus? What do you mean by sinus? Attic sinus uh, tensa retraction. Because, uh, so, so sinus, you mean it's in the... Sinus means when this posterior superior, posterior superior. Posterior superior retraction pocket goes inside sinus the... Sinus tympani the, or something. Yes, okay. the sinus tympani. Attic when it's in the, in the pars placida. Retrotympanic means. Yeah, and the okay. other is tensor retraction when it's mainly in the parts tensor. Thank you. Uh, it's, it strikes me that the only change that there has been has been the introduction of obliterative techniques. So the, the um, papers that you looked at, Trinidade, which is Matthew Young's paper, I think, they did an open cavity with a primary obliteration. And obviously Thomas Soma's 
and Erwin Officier's study does show significantly lower recurrence rates. Uh, do you think that's the way forward, or are you still a little bit skeptical? No, 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 no. Now, uh, at the moment, I'm going, I'm going to, I'm going to collect a lot of patients that start uh, even several years ago with some obliteration, because uh, sometimes we must not be pragmatic. Oh, I, I'm not, I'm not pragmatic. So of course, when it's possible, we do close to knee. But we know that this particular here, close to knee, is associated with the high res, res, you know, recidivist rate. And opening knee is associated with, associated with the high number of um, discharging here. So we started uh, seven, eight years ago to do master, open mastodectomy with uh, obliteration, but we mainly use um, muscle, muscle periosteal flap instead of uh, uh, bony watts. We had excellent result, especially because now, after some year of training, if, if we look at the, at the sternal uh, ear canal, during the follow-up, sometimes it's also it's difficult also for me to recognize if I don't read the surgical report if this child was operated uh, through a close technique on open technique, they're obliterated. Because after several years, uh, also could be the same you, your experience, uh, Thomas, sometimes very difficult in this patient to know if you obliterate or not because they, um, they seem to have uh, a close technique. And why do you use soft tissue instead of bone pate when you obliterate? Uh, I use a bone pate under the soft, the soft tissue, and I put over the soft tissue very often now. I, I feel well to put over some uh, special, the commercial name in Italy is um, Lyoplant. It's something like Life Alliance Dura because it's a little stronger and improve uh, the healing over the soft tissue. Because the problem of the soft tissue is only the granulating tissue that you can find after the follow-up. It's very troublesome and disturbing for several months, especially in children. Because the problem in children is that, that uh, it's not easy to have an appropriate follow-up. It's not easy to uh, have a, a good automicroscopy during the follow-up. Because children is not uh, so has not so a lot of cooperation, of course. And then what is important is uh, to improve the healing because uh, you cannot uh, suck the CR, you cannot uh, do any medication with the microscope in the CR. This uh, child is a very young child because uh, he never collaborate. I thank you very much, Fran Franco, again for your very nice talk.